On August 23rd, Lincoln writes a famous memorandum. It didn't become known until years later, but he, put, he, he has his cabinet sign an envelope with a document in it which he didn't show them what it said. He said, I want you to all agree to what's in this, docu in this envelope, and I'm not showing you what it is. What was it? It says this. This morning, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it shall be my duty to so cooperate with the president-elect as to save the union between the election and the inauguration, as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. In other words, I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to be reelected. We're going to have to cooperate with the president-elect and try to save the Union in the interim period between November 1864 and the inauguration of March 1865. Anyway, Lincoln has them sign it, doesn't show them what it is, only later does it come out what was in this envelope. So let's, that's probably the low point of Lincoln's presidency, April 23rd. But then, as often happens in history, strange things or surprising things happen. The next week, the Democratic National Convention meets to nominate its candidate for president, and they nominate General McClellan, the former general, a very popular guy in many parts of the North. McClellan is a war Democrat. He's opposed to emancipation, but he is not for abandoning the war. Lincoln lets Vallandigham come back from Canada to attend the convention in order to tar the Democrats with this thing. And the Vallandigham's men actually write the platform. The platform of the Democratic Party calls for an armistice and a peace conference. End the war, have a peace conference, stop the war. McClellan repudiates the platform. The candidate says, I am not in favor of stopping the war unless it's negotiated, because once you stop it, you'll never be able to start it up again. So the Democratic Party kind of splits over the so-called peace plank in their platform, and it gives Republicans, um, I don't know, a new, a new uh, breath of life that they can now attack the Democrats as trying to abandon the whole war and the union and everything. Meanwhile, probably more importantly, um, in early September, General Sherman captures Atlanta, finally captures Atlanta. And uh, there he is. Hard, hard war, there he is. Sherman, Sherman's capture of Atlanta really changes the whole political mood in the North. Um, if you happen to be in Atlanta, you can visit the Atlanta Cyclorama. Anyone have seen that? It's a giant um, circular painting of the Battle of Atlanta with all sorts of light effects and narration. It's, it's kind of dramatic. I went down there once uh, with my wife and saw it, and then walking out, I mumbled something about, I don't know, that I felt the treatment of General Sherman in the narration was not historically accurate. And my wife said, be quiet, we're in enemy territory. So <laughs> um, Sherman's, Sherman's capture of Atlanta really changes the whole dynamic of the presidential election, which is coming up in November, which we'll get to in a minute. But of course, after the election, on November 10th, I guess, Sherman sets out on his famous march to the sea. See, Sherman's march from Atlanta down to Savannah, okay? March to the sea, cutting himself off from his supplies, living off the land, marching his army, no army in front of him. It's not a, he's not attacking an army. He's marching through the heart of Georgia. Slaves by the thousands leave the plantations in order to come to Sherman's army and gain their freedom. Um, nobody knows where he is. He's not communicating. Lincoln says, I know what hole he went in at, but I can't tell what hole he will come out of. Where is he going? Some people think his army has been destroyed by Confederates somewhere. Finally, right before Christmas on December 21st, 1864, he emerges at Savannah, at the sea. It's interesting, how, what word do we use for Sherman? Did he 
conquer Savannah, occupy Savannah, or liberate Savannah. Depends on who we're talking about, right? For the Confederates, they're conquered. For the slaves, they're liberated. The liberation of Savannah, I prefer to call it that. But whatever it is, why does Sherman do this? Well, he wrote to Grant asking for permission to do it. He says, until we can repopulate Georgia, it is useless for us to occupy it. But the utter destruction of its roads, houses, and people will cripple their military resources. By attempting to hold the roads, we gain no result. I can make this march and make Georgia howl. If the North can march an army right through the South, it is proof positive that the North can prevail in this contest. What is the purpose then? It's to destroy resources. And by the way, even though he says people, they destroyed all sorts of property, but they did not actually attack civilian people. Um, and in fact, when soldiers did commit violence against civilians, who at this point is mostly women and children, Sherman punished them rather severely. But um, the, the point is morale. It's to make the South realize that it cannot win the war. If the North, he says, can march an army right through the South, it is impossible for the Confederacy to win this war. In early January, in Savannah, Sherman meets with a group of black ministers there, about 15 to 20 of them, in what is a very famous document of Civil War history, which is called the Colloquy with Colored Ministers. That's the official army title, Colloquy with Colored Ministers. And there's an army, the Secretary of War, Stanton, has come down from Washington for this. And there's a stenographer there taking notes. Sherman asks them questions, their leader, a local Baptist minister, um, and, and then their reply. So it's an interesting conversation. But from our point of view, Sherman says, what is slavery? What, well, how do you understand slavery? And Reverend Garrison Frazier, their spokesman, says, basically, slavery is taking your labor, someone's labor. Slavery is taking someone's labor without their consent. That was Lincoln's definition of slavery, remember? This is a very widespread definition of slavery. Sherman says, what is freedom? What is freedom? Frazier said, freedom is being able to enjoy the fruits of our own labor. Sherman says, how can you do that? How can you enjoy the fruits of your labor? Frazier says, give us land. Give us land and we will be able to support ourselves and enjoy the fruits of our labor. A few days later, Sherman issues what is called Field Order Number 15. Field Order Number 15. It sets aside a swath of land, about 50 or 60 miles inland, from the coast along the south, this is a so-called low country of South Carolina and Georgia for the exclusive settlement of black families. In other words, it takes the land of the richest part of the planter class and says, we're going to divide that up among these black families. Each family will be entitled to 40 acres of land. And by the way, the army has th hundreds, thousands of mules, which have been carrying supplies all the way down our march. Most of them are kind of broken down and worn out. And if you want a mule, you can have that too to help you farm. This is the origin of the phrase 40 acres and a mule, which reverberates throughout Reconstruction, Sherman's field order. And by the summer of 1865, some number, it's a little unclear, 50, 60,000 African-American people are settled on Sherman land. Now, why does Sherman do this? Is Sherman a radical Republican? No, not in the slightest. Is Sherman believe in the redistribution of property to the poor? No, that's not why he's doing it. He's doing it for two reasons. One, because of what these ministers told him is what African Americans wanted, and he appreciated the fact that they were loyal to the Union, whereas most of the whites around there weren't. And second of all, he didn't want, no army wants thousands of poor civilians traipsing along with the army, right? They get in your way, you have to feed them, it makes it impossible for your army to move fast. 
So he wants to do something with this mass of people who have followed his army, and settling them on land seems like a pretty good idea. So what, whatever, and it doesn't come, it, there's no, they got title to the land, they get little, but it's not clear who owns that land, is this permanent, is it temporary, but that issue will flow over, as we'll see, into Reconstruction. But again, the, the debate over what's going to follow slavery is now definitely joined in many ways.